Let's see, Adam, I guess for you, it's good evening. It is. And for you, it's good new time zone. It's yeah, yes, it's uh, you know, it's uh, now daylight savings time. Lost an, an hour's sleep last night. Yeah, you'll gain it back. Yeah. Personally, I think we should all just do like Iceland, switch to UTC, and be over with it. Solar precision, be damned. Well, I th I thought about that actually. At one time, I had my computer set to uh, to well, I suppose GMT, uh, but I realized that changing the day at at what would be sort of like four in the afternoon would create all sorts of confusion. Changing the date, you mean? Yes, the, the date. But that's the date that would it would just become a serial number for a twenty four hour period. Which I mean, and in Jewish timekeeping, uh, we switch date at sunset, which is different every day. Oh, but that, that's complicated, doesn't it? Well, except we also have time that follows that. In which case, it's the same time every day. When do astronomers change the date? Hmm. <laughs> I, I don't know if they do. Um, I think they just use UTC. They don't care about dates, really. Let's see. I had a question for you about the Linux format uh, magazine that you mentioned at the BAA meeting. Mm -hmm. um, I think you said it was the April issue, and I don't see an April issue yet. But I found an article from last. It's it's, it's number three hundred. It's it's the March issue. It's called April. It's like cars; they always sold with a year number that's one beyond the current year. <laughs> But it's I may not, not it, have gotten into the, the database that the library uses, but I found another one from last summer. Yes. Uh, Mike Bedford's emulate the first portable computer. Rounding off our emulation series, Mike Bedford's revives the first portable computer that ran the bizarre APL language. Bizarre. That's us. <laughs> yeah, the, this article was a follow up to the previous one. Um, so. I guess I got some feedback on the first article and decided to do one more in more in depth. Well, actually, did have a fairly good description of the fifty one hundred. Unfortunately, they couldn't get AP. Well, the the way I got it from through the library, uh, you know, the APL in the text was pretty much unreadable. And I was sorry that he didn't mention that that APL came from an, an ec from math notation. Yeah. The the name is misleading, right? It's called a programming language when it's the least programming language of the programming languages. Anyway, welcome Norman. Don't forget to unmute yourself if you when you're going to say something. Okay. You there you go. Am I better? Yes, now it's a lot better. Good. <laughs> it's just better if you hear me. <laughs> And uh, Ray, welcome. You found your way. And if you want us to, see, yeah, there's something on top of your camera, so, that, so we only see the bottom three. It's like the an eye that's blinking. I don't know what it is. What is? All right, let me fix that by doing this.
<sighs> That's interesting. Well, you got enough picture of me. You don't need much more. <laughs> so, we are now at the hour. Um, more people might be joining in, but we'll see. Um, it tends to be that the big audience is the one that watches things afterwards on YouTube. We cannot choose a time of day that is appropriate for all time zones. So um, our guest today is Norman Thompson, who I personally don't really know a whole lot about. And I mean... You're, APL... you're a youngster, Adam, that's why. Sorry? You're a youngster compared with me, that's why. Uh, yeah, but that didn't mean we didn't have APL2 in depth at home on the on the shelf. Um, although you also have a different book from uh, earlier than that, uh, the the one on mathematics, right? The APL programming for the mathematics classroom. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that's from 89. And then there's the APL 2 in depth from 1995. And having written these books together with the people that, uh, well, one of them was together with, with Ray, um, and, and clearly, going some depth, you must have some stories to tell about your history with APL and um, and how these things came about. Well, I certainly have a history, and I have to say that I haven't had a, an APL keyboard under my fingers for over 30 years, um, which uh, in a way gives me the chance to look back reflectively on the, uh, the 70s and the 80s, which were the years in which ABL really grew. But, uh, even with Jay, I haven't done anything with that for years. So in anticipation of this um, campfire, I put myself through a, a relearning process of, of Jay, uh, which I've got to say gave me insight into the uh, enormity of the, the task of grasping J for somebody who's coming in right from the cold. So in a way, these um, this sort of background of, uh, of the fact that I haven't touched the keyboard, an APL symbolic keyboard for 30 years gives me a strange kind of, well, I won't say it's authority, but a strange kind of something. <laughs> so um, maybe I should uh, so a little bit of background. I joined IBM in Hursley in 1989, having spent the previous nine years in teaching uh, with a bit of research, um, which was at St. Andrews University, into statistics uh, and linguistics, with the object of seeing whether computers, as they were in those days, could be used in identifying authorship, or I should say the combination of, of, of computers and statistics could be used uh, in identifying authorships. Now, when I joined um, IBM at Hursley, that's the English lab for uh, those who are not familiar, uh, PL1 was the focus of that laboratory. IBM had charged the English lab with uh, the development of PL1, which was to be the all-time uh, computer languaging language, uh, embracing all that was best, all the best features of every other computing language at the time. Uh, our goal for Tran, Kubo, even. Um, so there were, if you like, at that point in time, two completely different interpretations of a programming language. As far as IBM was concerned, a programming language meant a universal programming language, which would be adopted by all computers and all programmers everywhere. Now, I think there is a fallacy in that, in that uh, when you probe deeply into these old-fashioned languages, uh, there's a uh, contradictions, uh, uh, um, 
differences, irreconcilable differences between them. But never mind. Uh, that was the that was the philosophy, and that was what uh, what um, IBM what what IBM at Halsey was doing. Now contrast that with a programming language, in the uh, sense to which we are accustomed, which was the idea of a unification of natural and computing languages, and don't forget this time in the states Chomsky's thinking on languages, Noel Chomsky's thinking was very fashionable, particularly the idea of deep structure in languages, the idea that um, underlying all human languages, be they primitive languages in Borneo or the Sahara, or sophisticated languages like, 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 uh, like, like English and Spanish, but there is something that is common to the wiring up of human, uh, human beings that makes all languages similar in their, their deep structure. So that I think was very much, um, if you like, the, 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 in the philosophical background of, uh, of, of Ken and his associates. Uh, coming back to uh, uh, IBM and PL1, um, a large part of the work of what went on in Hersley was dealing with what we call APARs. Now, the problem is that when you introduce a new feature into a programming language, then you can only do so by considering its, its potential interactions with all the features you've got, you've got already. So introducing a single new feature means uh, creating interactions which you have to resolve with a whole panoply of, 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 of existing features. And of course, sooner or later customers uh, called in or wrote in or sent messages in saying, Look, we've tried doing this and this, what should it do? And so folk in Hersley, the PL1 folk, had to think out, well, just, just what it means when you do these uh, uh, interesting new combination of features. Um, so that was uh, APARs were a, a big part of, of, of uh, developing PR1 in that way. If we look at the other aspect, if we look at what was going on in, in the mind of Keynes and others, then in a way, you, you, you go back maybe 400 years before Christ to the, the, the Greek philosophers who started to see reason as something rather fundamental to the development of the human mind. And that's philosophers like uh, Zeno and then later Plato and Pythagoras and so on started thinking about things. They reached the point where they said, well, you know, we, human beings all reason after some fashion. We all reason differently, and if only we all reasoned in the same way, then you know there would be no war, no violence. Everybody would agree about everything. In other words, there must be some sort of ultimate reason, which is somehow beyond human grasp, that makes all things, you know, panagloss in a panglossian world makes all things well. So then you fast forward in the, the, the way that the human thinking developed through the age of philosophy and writing and all the rest. Computer languages, serious computer languages and a means of giving instructions to machines is less than 100 years old. Um, now, human languages didn't need to be anything like as uh, 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 precise and carefully structured as uh, human, human languages, and as we all know, they are loose and, well, it's what makes them colourful and, 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 and valuable, but that wouldn't do for, uh, for computers and for machines. And um, of course, also, the idea of read from the left and execute from the right was just not necessary because uh, if you're talking or speaking or conversing in human languages, then the execution, executing things 
doesn't really have any 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 uh, significant meaning. Anyway, coming back to uh, what IBM paid me to do at Hersley, um, I was being paid to uh, teach, given my background, that wasn't surprising, and um, in a humble way, help develop PL1. Um, APL, I've got to say, was a very flexible uh, organization, and um, it certainly didn't uh, stand in the way of my propounding the, uh, the new gospel, the new APL gospel, and teaching it to anyone who would listen or discuss it with me. And that's how I met you, Ray, incidentally. Um, we met in Poughkeepsie, if you remember, many years ago, it must have been 71, something like that. Uh, IBM certainly didn't pay me to go and uh, do APL. It didn't stop me meeting Ray. And uh, again, that's how a very long friendship has developed. Um, as a side little story from that period, uh, I recall being phoned up by somebody in the British Computer Society um, who was organizing a debate uh, in London on PL1 versus APL, which well, APL had grown to be a significant uh, language alongside PL1 by those days. Anyway, I said, uh, yes, I'd be happy to do that. And so we had a, a discussion on what was expected, the ins and outs of the, uh, of the debate, and uh, what folk would say in their, in, in their opening speeches. Well, that discussion got uh, it got a little bit sort of fraught um, as time went on, and eventually I found myself saying, "By the way, which side uh, are you expecting me to be on?" <laughs> and they were expecting me to be talking about PL one. But by that stage, my enthusiasm was very much on the on the other side. Uh, now, talking to about the people who I encountered and met in, um, in APR, I would identify four main types of people. There were the accountants and planners inside IBM. Um, they were the people who discovered that they could do the sort of arithmetic that was tedious and you had to get along a programmer to do things in Fortran or whatever or PR1 with you. They discovered they could do these kind of accounting and, uh, and planning things by themselves. They, they cut out the middleman of the process and they loved it. And they weren't principally in labs, of course. They were principally in the uh, our IBM headquarters, which were in North Harbour, and of course, even more of them in Paris and the, 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 the Europe headquarters. So I found myself doing quite a lot of teaching of, uh, of, of these of these kind of folk. Um, outside IBM, the view was to uh, statisticians and forecasters, in many cases that people are academics in, the, in universities, they found this was a wonderful way of bringing to immediate execution the things that they were teaching in their classes. Uh, that was my third category. And my fourth category was what I would call enlightened teachers in the education of younger people, in the education of secondary pupils. There weren't too many of them, but um, there were enough to, to to see the light, and many and some of them were early subscri subscribers to the uh, the Vector magazine, which I'm sure you all know. I suppose I should add a fifth class, and that is linguists. Um, now, linguists, I guess, were more academic and more uh, theoretical than actual, although there was interest in the kind of foundation principle that every linguistic morpheme should have, a, every that's a linguistic unit like a word, should have one and only one part of speech. 
you know, I presume that from time to time you've heard the phrase, uh, the cat phrase, time flies like an arrow, which is a perfectly sensible um, phrase in English. But if you think about it, time can be a noun, time, the thing that flies like an arrow, the thing that flies. Um, time can be a, a verb. It's an instruction, it's an imperative. Do something to stop watch. Time, time that flies, that's a good ride. Um, it can be an adjective. Time flies, you know, like, um, I don't know, like house flies, time flies, and they like arrows. So, I mean, time can have these three uh, distinct uh, parts of speech, which is, of course, extremely. Uh, confusing, but a total no-no as far as any computer language is concerned. But I think the big thing um, that uh, was uh, dominant in computer languages is, is, is that each um, symbol or word or whatever had to have a uniquely defined part of speech. It belonged to a verb, it belonged to an adverb, it belonged to a conjunction or whatever. And of course, Jay made that even clearer than the uh, than APL did. But you can accommodate this in languages, for example, inflection and verbs. And inflection is just a, um, a combination of verbs and, 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 and verbs. Now, what about um, APL in the, what I call the secondary education, where you were education in, 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 in schools, and where schools in England, I should say, it's, when we use the term schools in, in the UK, we are thinking of pre 18 schools, at the later stages of these, uh, of, uh, of these schools. And uh, messages were sent to them in, in, in education vector. I like to think I thought of that idea of education vector. It was basically the idea that the, the Guardian newspaper, which is one of the, uh, the big serious newspapers in the UK, they published every week something called the Education Guardian. So I thought, well, that's a the education vector. And so we put that into vector. Um, I was lucky in being friendly with, with um, a, a, a teacher who was one of the uh, great pioneers of modern mathematics in the UK, a gentleman called John Dubbin. He happened to live a oh, short distance from us. And John was an absolute fanatic. He learned about APL. He learned about it from me, I guess. And he became an absolute fanatic. He was a bachelor master. He had big rooms in, 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 in Winchester College. And he became tied to the computer his computer, which had APL, uh, which had APL on it. And um, he would literally sit up all night doing things, working out how this um, would do wonderful things in uh, demonstrating uh, mathematics and enlightening mathematics to his pupils. We went further, that you, some of you may remember Anthony Camacho, who actually wrote, wrote, was a great enthusiast for, for, for uh, the role of APL in schools also. Um, we got to the length of, of, of organizing a teacher conference in, in, uh, in, in Winchester. Um, Anthony circulated all the local authorities uh, to try and drum up uh, interest in, in, um, in APL and getting into the, into the, the general school system in, in the UK. That didn't happen. But um, in a way, it didn't matter. Looking back, we all had a, all of us who were involved uh, had a very good time in sharing our experiences uh, uh, and our enthusiasm for uh, the APL. Now, I've got to come back to Thursday because on the occasions when I've um, remembered that there are these APL Association um, uh, webinars on Thursdays, uh, I was expecting really to sit back and be bamboozled by the sheer uh, technical uh, advance that APL has made. But Adam, your uh, talk or your demonstration on Thursday absolutely resonated in an extraordinary way uh, 
with me because if there is one thing I would say, if I to summarize my experience of everything I've said or done, APL or J, I would summarize it in the sentence, mastering rank is essential. Now, this brings me back to, you know, I talked about the planners and the accountants who just were worried about APL because they could do things on their own, uh, on their own laptops and on their small computers. I recall when APL2 was first thought of, and uh, there, there, there were beta versions, I guess, and that kind of thing. I remember giving a talk to an audience of such folk, the planners uh, from our headquarters uh, in, in the UK. And uh, I explained to them, I think uh, quite well, how much the idea of boxing and rank and so on was going to expand the value of, of APL. And um, Having uh, done so, I remember finishing off by saying, well, um, having made that um, clear, it produced a force of laughter. And I think at that point, it, it demonstrated that the, 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 the APL2 was a big, big advance forward. It was a big dividing line in making LP, uh, making APL uh, the language that it is, as opposed to being just arithmetic on your own, uh, arithmetic on your own keyboard. So that, that uh, moment or moments when APL2 came on the scene in that period really was absolutely uh, critical in, in, in the history of APL. Now, what, what I, um, marveled at on Thursday and what I sat here blissfully uh, going through your discussion of rank and the rank operator in dialogue was the way in which I have tried in the past to put across the idea of translating mathematics into APL. That after all was the original drift of, of, of um, virus and thinking. You take some you take some mathematics, the advanced mathematics, should we say, and you put this into APL. So what you do, you stay calm, you sit down, and you think, and with a clear mind, you start from the mathematics, and you express the same uh, mathematical ideas in APL. So, this is where rank comes in, because supposing you're doing this with simple as, something as simple as um, evaluating determinants uh, in, in, a, in a mathematical way, what you do is you um, take, take, take a, a, a sum, a1 times the minor of a1 plus a2 times the minor of a2. Now what you're doing is you take a scalar and you're multiplying by something which is rank two. So you take careful consideration of this. Uh, you type it into your um, into your session, and um, well, what always happens to me first time, not to you, Adam, but I know, but to me first time, of course, it comes up with some error. It's got a rank error, or it's got a syntax error, or less. So you say to yourself. I say to myself, right, stay calm. Now, you, there's something you've not quite thought about. Typically, the things I would be typing would be plastered with eaches. Um, so start it all over again. Uh, just think it through. Be careful. Make a little tweak here. Yes, I think I see what I've done wrong. And of course, another error message. Stay calm. Well, just a second. Eventually, you get a little more heated about it, and you say, "Well, you take an each out there, and an each in there, and so forth," and you bash away. And well, if you're lucky, it comes out well in the end. Or well, actually, if you usually, if you go away and come back and think about another day, it'll come up. But you see what I mean? It's 
getting rank right is absolutely crucial to doing this high level thinking in APL where you take something that, it, that, that you can do in math and, uh, 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 and express it in, uh, in APL. So APL then, as I say, went really, as far as I'm concerned, there was a, a really severe dividing line where we left the, as we say, the, uh, the commonplace users like the accountants on one side and where we really got, uh, we really went universal. Now, I hope I'm not boring everybody. No, no, of course not. I just like to say my, 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 looking back, my ABL life was driven by coincidences. Coincidence one happened at Hansley. Remember, this was the PL1 environment. And there was a notice went round that there was a, um, a, a session of five day little mini course on something called a programming language, which was at St. Andrews University, which was of course where I did my research degree. And um, not only was that my association with St. Andrews, my mother lived within 10 miles of, of university. So what was St. Andrews, I'm going to go there. If it had been Nottingham or Exeter or somewhere like that, I probably wouldn't have bothered. Uh, but I went and it was given by Keith Smilly. Again, some of you may know Keith. And um, it was those days where APL, where you demonstrated it by having a camera uh, focused on the keyboard and then the output was delivered to a computer screen. Remember these things? Anyway, of course, I was completely sold on it. And that, I guess, was the, uh, you know, my, my first um, great moment uh, in my life when, a when APL entered into it. And as I say, it was a coincidence of the place where this particular series of sessions took place. Then there was a second coincidence, and that is Donald McIntyre. And I know no longer with us, but again, many of you, I'm sure, will know him. Uh, I remember quite vividly Ken introducing Donald to me uh, at one of these conferences. I can't remember which APL conference it was. I can remember the lunch and I can remember the, um, the enthusiasm we had. Now, coincidentally, you, re you remember where the conference was? It was in America somewhere. <laughs> America's quite a big place, I know. <laughs> but, uh, I've, uh, and uh, the approximate year, maybe? So the, the approximate year probably was California actually, but I remember this little chat. I remember the lunch meeting. <laughs> that was a big thing. And um, anyway, the, 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 the coincidence was that Don was evacuated in wartime and grew up in the same small town, which is about twenty miles from here in Scotland. And uh, we both loved the hills. We both loved the the, uh, the surroundings. Of course, Don was deep into geology. But we had this this common love, and there was a tremendous uh, coincidence uh, in that. Um, don't forget that, of course, I, I nothing I, I had nothing to do with APL except teach it. And of course, that's where I met Brea, as I mentioned earlier, who's in like mind. But that was because it was P01 uh, that drew me there. Then. Coincidence three was the fact that, well, Winchester's uh, IBM laboratory, they happened to situate it near one of the most uh, high powered uh, public schools in Britain. Uh, public schools means that they're private schools, which they are very select, uh, selected. And our present prime minister, uh, Rishi Sunak, was the head boy of, um, uh, of, of that school. And uh, it was a head, I mean, they were very bright. And the teachers were enormously bright, and so was John. And John was a national figure in the world of mathematics teaching. And the fact that um, he, he and I became friends, we incidentally both went to the same schools in Edinburgh, so another little bit sort of, sort of similar, for instance. Then let me tell you of another coincidence, um, which actually had nothing to do with. Um, 
my, well, I suppose in a way it did, it was subject to my own development. I was in Toronto on some IBM business, I forget what, probably PR1 uh, related. And I was walking down one of the um, streets in Toronto, minding my own business, when I ran into Ken. Now, Toronto is really quite a big place. And the coincidence of, of, of bumping into Ken in the street just was so enormous that I sort of started to think about it. Anyway, we, that, that's the only time I, I was in IBM process to, to Ken, but that takes moved away from, uh, from APL. So, so um, I just can't stop thinking that one of the um, great uh, influences in my, in my life. Let me, let, let me tell you another little story, which, well, it certainly amuses me to think back on it. Um, some of you may remember John McPherson, who was a, a, a director of, uh, of, or a, I should say, a vice president of IBM. John was a great uh, enthusiast for APL. He saw, I think, more than anybody else in the really top hierarchy of, of, of the company of the potential of, of APL. Anyway, there was a, a, an APL meeting in um, somewhere like Rochester or, or Westchester. And uh, John said, well, if, if you have any difficulty getting the funds to come across, come and stay with me, uh, which I did. And this was a conference. Some of you may remember it was in the APL in the, the Hilton Hotel in New York. And um, the Hilton oh. Hotel was not very well organized over the um, organization of lunch. And there were enormous queues and it became completely um, uh, completely an obvious, obvious that if we, by the time we got to the queue, we'd be past the start time of the afternoon session. So I said to John, who was my host in all senses, I said, look, John, we're not going to wait for this. We're going to get lunch quickly. Let's go out into the street and we'll, we'll go and have some sort of lunch in the first place we can find. The first place we, we could find was the sort of the McDonald's. And I remember uh, I got John, you know, some of the in the McDonald's fashion. Pastor John, you know, I never been in one of these places. <laughs> and uh, I, it did strike me afterwards, well, that isn't quite how you was it 83 or 86? Approach an IBM vice president, but <laughs> it was a funny moment in my life anyway. If it was in New York, it must have been 89, no? That was 80, if APL, APL 89 was New York, yeah. Do you remember, do you remember the, uh, the chaos over, over lunches? No? Well, I, I missed eight, the one in 89 because my sister was born at that point. But uh, so. Well, if you've gone to an APL session, you'd also have missed lunch. So there <laughs> I would have been four years old anyway. So <laughs> <laughs> I, think, uh, I was quite old. Anyway, since since I retired from IBM, and that was 1994, then um, I did actually um, work for something called the Open University, which is a distant university. And then oh. computing. Oh, yes, I, I taught computing courses, but computing was C and Java and uh, ultimately object orientation. Now, object orientation I do love. And I, I think the intellectually, if you like, the kind of background of object orientation um, has a lot to do with APL thinking. Anyway, I retired, of course. When I got too old for, for, for that sort of um, university teaching, and I then turned back to the, uh, the outer doors that I mentioned when we talked about Donald McIntyre. I started writing uh, local guidebooks and things like that, got far, far away from APL and, uh, 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 and jail. So, what switches me on? Switches me on, uses, has always switched me on as J for exposition, not APL for production, if you like, and for, for, for uh, pr producing clear um, programs that run faultlessly. It's APL in making math, arithmetic, more uh, acceptable to 
people in, uh, in, in the world whom I was teaching. Uh, now, a few of seminars ago, it was a rare, you made my, you, you made a comment about eigen analysis. Now, do you remember that? I did send you a little script on that because eigen analysis is one of these areas of uh, mathematics where, yes, you can get the fundamental idea across with the simplest of APL. You simply do it with two by two matrices and you can show people how APL works. I'll demonstrate in a week if you want, but I think we'll have a pause for, 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 for other comments. But it's one of the things, but scale this up to big matrices. And remember where the real world, where the real world is using icon analysis, and it turns up all over the place. It turns up in forecasting. It turns up in things called factor analysis, which is where you do market analysis and, and, and say what are the factors that drive your customers. It even turns up in biology. It turns up uh, in all manner of places. And people in these philosophical in these um, academic disciplines demand good icon packages and good eigen packages must be ultra robust. Now, I don't know, Adam, you can say whether, whether Dialog has actually produced uh, a full-blown eigen package, has it? Um, we have something called the maths library, uh, oh. which can is, you just plug in and then you have access to it. It's actually not implemented in the APL. It's right. so probably in C or, in, or Fortune. I'm familiar with MathLab. Um, but yeah, but of course that's not an APL. The math lab is very, very well there. And I mean, I imagine that you were writing uh, an eigen package, uh, an eigen analysis package, a big one for commercial production. I fancy that about 5% of it would be mainline code. And the other 95% would, would, would be dealing with the exceptional conditions, the singularities, the, um, the, the uh, tolerance problems because when I mean it's massively computing intensive um, do, do, doing uh, eigen analysis with large numbers of variables large numbers might be hundreds even thousands and of course you're up against I think in APL it's, is it called quark GT tolerance the uh, you know the system variable um, you're up against the, the, the tolerance of the uh, the tolerance of the computing when is a very very tiny number equal to zero. So it's a very sophisticated um, matter for a, 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 a computer, uh, for somebody uh, constructing a production package for IV analysis. It's a very, very uh, sophisticated business where you have both computing and expert numerical analysts involved. But, and I come back to, to Ray, I sent you a small script, Ray, right? Explaining how I would have explained the idea for that uh, analysis. Great. I had, a, I had a little trouble understanding it actually. Norman, um, I want to ask you a question. How did we get together? I don't remember. But I all I remember is we we were using IBM. We were fortunate that we were both in IBM and so we could use uh what preceded internet sending messages back and forth. But how did we decide to do it together. I don't remember that. Do you? Well, I can, you mean the icon analysis? When did we decide to do it together? Uh, that's a good question. I guess we kept on meeting each other at these conferences because IBM, uh, they were quite happy for me to go to anything with uh, any conference with APL on, the, uh, on its label. Um, we must have got it was after your Sandra Payton book. In fact, it was with APL2. No, APL2. APL2 was the dividing thing. I said that was a dividing line. And um, we must have exchanged uh, ideas and information about how, I, how APL2 was revolutionizing, revolutionizing the possibilities. That, I think, was when it was. Now, APL2, I gave that to, oh, I can't. 79 or so, wasn't it? I think what? that must be. It well, was... I, as I recall it, you had written this book, APL Programming for Math Classes, which caught yeah. my eye. And that was in 1989, wasn't it? 
Yes. Maybe. Could be. And I guess maybe I approached you and saying, uh, gee, we ought to do something more advanced in APL. And I, I, I think that's how we got started on APL and to APL 2 in depth because that came out in no time. Now, do you remember something at a conference when there was a meeting with a lady from McGraw Hill? And there was a meeting at which Ken was present, you were present, I was present, and McGraw Hill were anxious to have something in APL in their catalog. Do you remember that? That was the stimulus. Um, I guess that what had happened was that um, McGraw Hill must have approached Ken, and Ken said, Wow, well, um, there are these um, guys who are, are interested in, in, in APL and exposition, not APL in, in, in production, but APL and exposition. Uh, can I bring them along and can we have a meeting? That was the start of APL 2 in depth, which is the McCraw Hill book. Um, and that evolved. Again, I can't recall the individual uh, conference it took place on, but that was, um, you, you said 89, maybe it was, in, I said 79, maybe it was 85, 86, something like that. That was, that was the kickoff point. And then of course we had, what was it called? It's something to do with VM, uh, you know, the IBM internet. And that, at the time, you know, was something that everybody takes for granted nowadays. Mm. Um, on IBM, it was uh, great that we could communicate. We could even communicate by video conference. Do you remember that when I, been, when I moved to Greenup? Um, mm -hmm. Now the world takes internet for granted, but we thought this was our great privilege having VM. And on VM, you could actually access anybody you liked in the whole company. And that was amazing. We wanted to send a message to one of the vice presidents you sent a message and you got a reply from the guy, not from his secretary or his secretary's secretary, but it, I mean, it was superbly personal. Anyway, uh, sorry, APL 1995, well, thanks Curtis, yeah, <laughs> there we are. Um, anyway, uh, I feel I've spoken at great length and other people must have contributions. Um, well, you, we're here to listen to what, what you have to say, and it's okay. it's absolutely fascinating and how these coincidences came together, and then out of that comes one of those great books that I grew up with, at least. It was always on the shelf. Um, so, well, or, I, I'd like to ask Norman if um, how he got the publisher of APL2 in depth was Verlog. And that was a real Clancy publisher. I, you must have got it, got got together with them because I did not. That was the same publisher as the first book, right? The APL oh. APL programs for the mathematics uh, classroom was was also published by by Springer for that. Oh, that's how that's how he got into it. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. By that by that stage, as I say. Uh, the Grow Hill had one had decided another book was appropriate. And I suppose because APL2 had become um, uh, had become mainstream. Um, and I suppose Ken said, well, there's a couple of people here who uh, might be able to get together something for you. And uh, as I say, I, I, I remember the meeting, but uh, I, I can't remember the I can't remember the lunch. I can't remember what we had for lunch. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, so, but then, then what happened? So, in '95, the two of you and uh, wrote this the, the book APL two in depth, mm -hmm. um, and then, but by then, uh, J already existed, and at some point, you went over to use J instead of APL. Oh yes, I. That was at the European conference, and that must have been that must have been the late nineties, um, when Roger Healy and uh, and Ken Ken Ken's view, I'm sure, was that 
APL was the, 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 the great leap forward for himself. I really think that he had uh, at least philosophically and intellectually achieved more in um, with Jay than with uh, than with APL. Um, I don't think JPL is perhaps uh, any easier to use. I think J uh, I, from what I can see, a dialogue has has made APL the the real APL APL two and almost has made that more um, acceptable and easier to um, the, 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 the non-expert users. But from the, if you like, from the intellectual philosophical point of view, um, then I, I, I think that Ken regarded um, things like, well, the most important one was the establishing um, parts of speech and saying that, that part of the fundamental vocabulary of, of J is understanding uh, parts of speech. Of course, rank, as I said, is, a, is, is an absolutely primary thing to realize. It, it's, a, it's, it, it's Rank is a matter of appreciating data, but it's much broader than, uh, than, than, uh, than APL. It's vastly important in implementing things, but the, the realization that, that rank is um, important in understanding um, in understanding mathematics quite away from the, uh, the, the, the execution of it on the people is, uh, is important. And so I, 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 I think that uh, Ken's uh, felt, well, with my sensation that Ken felt his ideas were coming, uh, making a really fruitful addition to what I hinted at earlier, the, 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 the history of mankind's thinking from the time that human man, human beings began to be rational way back in, uh, in, uh, in, in Greek philosophical times. Um, and of course, Roger did a, an incredible uh, job in, uh, in implementing in J. Um, I, I, got any, I, I don't think I, I, I ever determined a single bug in J. It just it uh, it was just perfect. It did the right thing. What you had to be careful of, of course, was that if you say something in J, if you write an expression uh, uh, using the uh, using the symbols in J, whatever you have written has a meaning. I mean, I'm assuming it's syntactically correct. Um, it has a meaning. It may not be quite the meaning that you intended. So you have to be uh, exercise uh, caution in making sure that you uh, that you test things that you write on your keyboard uh, against uh, what, what what you expect, because you could deceive yourself. Um, Jay, Jay doesn't know what you were trying to say. It knows what you said, and it understands what you said, and it does what you say. Uh, it's got to be the thing that you really wanted it to, uh, that you really wanted it to say. What you're saying is it's quite hard to get a syntax error in J, right? Uh, well, yes, it's quite hard. It, it's very obvious if you've done, or pretty obvious if you've, if you've done so. Uh, the other thing, of course, is a great killer in J is to try to put everything in, in, in one line. The one-liners are desperate. Um, and, uh, you know, build things up in, 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 in uh, in short and simple things, because the, the the human mind can only resemble, uh, only retain a small amount of symbols. I mean, there is a sort of uh, a bit of an axiom that's you know not more than not more than seven symbols in a single function, or I'll spread it out into a uh, in, 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 into into its bits. But isn't that also because of the spelling that Jay uses? That makes it. I mean, I, I at least find it harder to parse as a human. Mm. Well, that's right. It 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 it, um, it, it, it throws light on, on the um, on understanding what parsing is in, in, in human languages. And um, also, the customer to go and mention Linda Alfred. Yes, I should. Have, uh, I have met Linda once, 
but again, that was a distant collaboration. Um, and Linda must have got in touch with me. I forget whether internet was a, a, a available at, a, at that time. But yes, um, this was something. And Linda, uh, Linda wrote that lovely little uh, alpha, the, the, the snail book. Remember that? Liked it. But that, that was a very um, enjoyable interaction period. And of course, Linda was aiming for, uh, to um, address uh, teaching to quite small children. Hmm. Norman? Yeah? Af after you went to J, did you not publish something else in, in uh, J? I remember well, reading it. I can't seem to find there it. Was, there was one called J, the Natural Language for Analytic Computing. Yes, that was uh, by an English publisher. Um, and that arose actually from our professor whom we had as a um, uh, you were an assignee at, at, for, for a while at at uh, at, 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 at Hursley. And um, I, I introduced him, I think, and anyway, that, that got round to um, that got round to a publication. Oh, I've got a copy in my hand at the moment, Change in Actual Language of Computing. Um, what was the title again? Uh, J, the natural language for analytic computing. Well, I don't have that. Um, I should think it's probably well out of print by now. <laughs> but you can try and do it going to uh, Amazon and typing in the title um, and so on. Uh, beware, if it, if it comes up and says it's got a very high value, um, what I find with Amazon is that, uh, and, uh, and the like is that uh, books which are not particularly worthwhile and are very difficult to get suddenly acquire huge values. Have you noticed, has anyone noticed that? Try, try, try asking for a book for decades sure. back. So, but, but anyway, Jay's in Watcher Language completely. It was, a way to, it was a bit like APL2 in depth. Um, it was a realization that there were all sorts of things that you could address in uh, it, uh, with J. In fact, I, it, um, for example, mathematics of J, complex uh, chapter on complex numbers, one on numerical basis and polynomials, one series, one calculus, a chapter on numerical methods. Didn't get round to icon analysis because for the reason that I just discussed lots, it, it's easy to put across principles, but difficult to do serious computing, uh, randomness, permutations and combinations, groups and symmetries, logic, all these things were opened up to um, uh, interpretation uh, in, in J. And I thought that was marvelous. And this book, uh, well, first of all, there's a bit about the syntax and how you actually, uh, how you actually learn it. So the, the, the first half is learning it, learning J, and the second half is um, is using it in the sort of context I just mentioned. Uh, and I would draft in that. And if if, um, if any of you've got vector, uh, then you, you know, it, it, was, it started off actually with the idea of a paragraph every now and again, oh. we call jottings, J ottings. Again, one of my sort of silly, clever, clever ideas. But it developed and I, I discovered that so far from just doing a doing a, a single point, um, describing a single feature of J, um, I find myself wanting to do a whole string of things and going and say, how, well, look, look, look at what, how you can get permutations in J, uh, look how you can uh, develop longer than ideas, longer than in J, look how you can uh, do the kind of things that I, I, I just mentioned, how you can do things with random numbers and, 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 and uh, so on, and see how trigonometry develops and see how you do 3D trig and J. Um, it, all, it all works. So th that developed into Johnson's. I think that was um, produced as an electronic book just a few years back. I just put into the into the chat a link to the vectors index of all these juddings. Sorry. 
I, but I didn't realize that was you. I remember the Juddings from when I was little. We'd always look forward to having Vector coming in by mail to my uh, to my father. Um, and I was reading uh, all these APL articles there. And then there were the, the Juddings, and they used this strange alien language, and I didn't understand the thing of what they were saying. It was clearly interesting subjects, but I couldn't understand the, the code that was there. Yeah. That was probably because I was writing two long lines. I don't know. No, because I didn't. I wasn't versed in J at all. I only. I was only a native APLer, and not, not didn't yeah. know any J. Yeah. yeah. I don't. I don't know if, you, if you'd like. I, I, you know, I said um, evaluating um, or e e expanding uh, icon analysis. Um, if you like, I can do a five-minute demonstration on that. By, by all means. Now, how do I share this? If I say share screen, does it? You, then it will ask you. Which screen? Which the screen, yeah. Or either the entire screen or a particular window. There should be a that window. Oh, yes. Yes, yes. Right. I don't know how to make it bigger, but... For Ray, right, two, a two-dimensional matrix. Hold on, we, we're not seeing your screen yet, so the, oh. the screen share hasn't quite been set up. Remember, you have to both select what you want to share and press the button on and the share button. I have to share screen. I have to press a button. Right. Whiteboard. And then... J software, this one, that one. Now let's see if it shares by any chance. If it does. Yes, it does indeed. Uh, yeah. It's just it's just getting started. So we can't quite see it yet. Just give it a few seconds. Now we can see it. So, see it. Yeah. so we see a J editor here with a matrix, two by two matrix. Yeah. Right. Oh, sorry. So you see M. I'm sorry. I don't know how to make it bigger than that. But... Just say, say uh, we are dealing with M um, for a matrix 4213, right? Yes. So, um, the determinant of M is simply 4 times 3 minus 2 times 1 is 10. That's probably well known. And that's, of course, it's a, a primitive in APR. And the, what's called the trace of M is simply the sum of the items down the leading diagonal, that's seven. Right? <coughs> now, using these two things, I can form a quadratic from M, right? And that is saying um, 10 minus 7x plus x squared. We have to solve that. And the solution of that equation is simply the eigenvalues Oh, sorry, I can go into it. Well, there's a bit of, old, of uh, code for you. Incidentally, it looks awful when you, I think it looks awful when you see it in box. Uh, but if I say show, show it, you see what I mean? Every, every, uh, it, it gives it as an expression instead, yeah. So let's look at the evals, the eigenvalues of M of that matrix. which happen to be five and two, right? Now, that's the eigenvalues, and they are the solutions of the equation. If you see them, uh, m minus x, five minus, three minus x down the leading diagonal, and the rest, the other two are unchanged, right? So you solve that uh, quadratic, and the solution of that is the, the eigenvalues. That's all there is to it. Now, you need eigenvectors as well, so we will add zeros to M. I'm sure you, I mean, I'm sure you're all saying, well, if I, if I had to do this in, on an APL screen, it would be uh, really lesson, lesson five in the, in, from, from scratch in APL, right? You need the first row, first row of M which is 4, 2, 
you need to apply those um, eigenvalues to M. What's happening, M, I've taken uh, five from four and to give it the leg one, two, and in the second row, I have got uh, the same thing by taking two from four. Right, four minus two and so, so, so I apply these to the eigenvalues. I'm then going to take one of these and um, um, Dio stands for diophantine. I'm solving diophantine equations. I have got to take uh, a solution of uh, minus x plus 2y is 0. Now, all these equations are, they are linear equations, are linear homogeneous equations. There's no constants. So if you think about it, 2, uh, two times um, the, the uh, uh, minus 1 plus 2 times 1 is 0. And if you're using the second eigenvalue, then uh, the second eigenvalue is 2. And if you look at the bottom row, 2 times 1 uh, plus uh, 2, 2 is the solution of 2, 2. You want, I want dial 2, 2. You solve these equations. Right? And 2 minus 2 is the solution of 2x plus 2y is 0 is x is 2, y is minus 2. Again, easy. Now, by obtaining these solutions, these solutions, you have, these are simply the eigenvalues of it. The eigenvalues are 2 long and 2 negative 2. Eigenvectors, no? Sorry? The eigenvectors. Yeah, the eigenvectors, sorry, the eigenvectors. Yeah. No, um, you can check it, of course. We have got the diagonal value of M. That's just M with its zeros added. Um, in mass, the, uh, the uh, matrix of eigenvectors is called Q, is, is by convention called Q, so we get QN. And uh, so if I show you um, MP, that's this is this matrix product, the usual matrix product is plus reduce dot times. That's the same as an APL incidental. Now I'm going to do a check and I will check. Uh oh, sorry, my computer. Okay. And all I'm doing in checking is I'm taking Q, multiplying it by the diagonal matrix and multiplying it by the triplicate Q. Now, if you've anybody who's done any um, uh, meet, uh, encounter with with uh, with eigen uh, values and eigenvectors, will know that Q, which is the matrix of eigenvectors, multiply by the diagonal matrix, that's the 5, 0, 0, 2 matrix, and then multiplied by q to the minus 1. Uh, that's the thing that will take you back to the original matrix, right? So um, if I do a check, I'll do a little check button. I'm sorry, my, my cursor wanders. Uh, I can't go bring it back to check. So if I do a check on M, then it brings it back to the original screen. That is the original matrix M, which I started with. Now, that of course illustrates the fact that I have done that matrix multiplication to diagonal. 2 to the minus 1 
is the demonstration that indeed these are the, eye, the, the, the eigenvectors of the matrix M. Do you see what I mean, Ray? With uh, small uh, tools and small, uh, small functions and easy things to do, which are only introductory in terms of, a, uh, of introducing the language of APL, it's possible to show the significance of, 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 um, of like in time. There's one significant one is, let me just show one thing. One thing which makes them particularly powerful is this. If I take M and I matrix multiplied by M and I matrix multiplied by M again, and I'll do that. Uh, if I do that um, four times, one, two, three, I'll do it one, one more time. Um, right. But what I've done is I have raised M. You see what, 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 uh, uh, what matrix multiply does? I have raised M to the fifth power. Right. Now, if I do the diagonal of this matrix, the diagonal of the matrix is C125 and 32. That is the eigenvalues. If I do the rounds, If I do the evolve of T, let's evolve the this matrix, they are 3, 1, 2, 5, and 32. If I do the events of T, Now, the point is here that if our effect eigenvectors are determined only within ratios because they are, they come from the solution of homogeneous equations. That's to say, um, simultaneous equations without constants on the right hand side. So the only thing that is important here is the ratio. And the ratio of these, as you can see, is exactly the same as the ratio of. Oh, uh, sorry, of the effects. Uh, two to one and two to minus two. Okay. Now, of course, this is enormously important because in order to evaluate a diagonal matrix to a high power, all you have to do is to raise the numbers on the leading diagonal to that high power. That power can be a million, right? So the diagonals of, for example, the, the diagonals of M to the power of a million are four to the minus four to the power of a million and three to the power of a million. And when you do the evaluation of uh, the Q diagonal two to the minus one, if you're evaluating that, you only need to evaluate the diagonal matrix rather than evaluate the high power of a matrix which has got uh, values, non zero values, all over the place. So that is one of the most enormous powers of, uh, of uh, eigenvectors, which is so you can demonstrate in the way that I've done here. Okay, again, I, I hope I'm making the point. And of course, all these, I, I haven't bothered showing all the um, or, or, or the, the uh, function lines involved. But you see how easy it is to, to put across the, the way in which, uh, if, if I, uh, in which uh, simple uh, eigenvectors come about. But yeah. One thing I noticed with the, what you're doing is um, you're hiding away the J language everywhere. Well, I'm, I'm only doing that for just for the economy of time. I mean, if we go back to where it all started, uh, the, for example, the trace. Uh, 
Oops, sorry, my, 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 cuss, my cursor is all over the place. It's a naughty cursor. Um, <laughs> have I got it? So, you might need to click on that line. Come on. No, I understand. I understand that the definitions are there. Um, she had traces that sorry, yeah. yeah, yeah, sure. I understand. But then even for matrix multiplication, you wrote MP instead of writing and the plus slash dot yeah. times. But uh, it's just it's just it's the, your style of, of writing J that you said also very few primitives on a uh, on a line of code. Let's look, let's look at what code does. You see, you have a part you have a um uh, a polynomial. Well, I should say show, shouldn't it? Show. Oh, show, show, show. Oh. I'm not as good as you are with my fingers. Adam. No, it's the, the A oh. should be an O. I'm thinking of literature in anyway. <laughs> right. there, There's what show is, right? So yeah. remember, I showed you that if I do it with M, the show of oh. You want quotes, Sorry, huh? Um, I mean, I, what I mean is uh, quad of them. Quad of them. If I do the quad of them, I do the quad of them. That's 10 minus 7 minus 1. Now you relate that. The 10 is the determinant. The right. negative 7 is the trace. And the 1 is just the 1. Right? Now, when I produce the, the uh, eigenvalues, um, uh, uh, I have to do an open. Well, I have to solve the quad. And the quad um, is solved by P. In other words, if I do the P, that's the solver on the quad of M, right? That's the five and the two, which are the eigenvalues. Um, the, it's a peculiarity of the, the, the way that Roger wrote this. Um, what this primitive P, the polynomial solver, is it comes as a, um, a, a two uh, item uh, vector. The first one is a scaling factor, which in this case is one, and the second one is the actual solution. So the solution of the equation 10 minus 7x plus x squared is indeed 5, 2. Right? And so when I come to do the evils, and again, I want to do a show on it, show. Uh, the open is a technicality because, of course, I have to get rid of that one to display the, the eigenvalues, right? So open simply gets rid of the um, gets rid of the one and and unboxes the five two, right? And there you see the p in the quad. You see what I mean? That the, the, the whole thing is is built up of very very simple operations, which are which are undemanding and would be equally undemanding uh, in it if you did it in APL. Um, but it puts across the principle, and that to me has always been the uh, the important value of of, 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 of J and L to me not actually producing production code. Nobody's actually paid me a penny any, any time in my life to pay production code, to, to develop production code in ANJ, in APL and J. But I like to think that it's helped a few folks somewhere down the line in understanding something. <laughs> okay, um, I'm sorry, I feel it's a campfire. I've dominated it so much. I must and and it's been excellent really interesting and fascinating to hear everything we have gone a bit over the normal time of an hour so we should probably round off one, let me interrupt one more time Norman why don't you share with us your latest writing for those that might come to visit Scotland so the latest what your latest writing your latest pub the latest oh. the writing, the latest writing is um, uh, a guidebook to the relatively small area of Scotland around here, which is called Murray, <laughs> um, and it's called it's a companion for walkers. 
because I'm an enthusiast for walking and walking around the track, riding the, uh, on the off-road tracks. Uh, I don't have an electronic version, I'm afraid, because the publishers no, never give me one. But that, is, that has been published by uh, a local publisher in, uh, in Edinburgh, or local, local to Scotland, I should say. I mean, it's a, uh, they, they, um, they publish a lot of Scottish books. Um, so that has been uh, well. Actually, what I uh, yes, I, uh, can I do a? I can do a word version. I think if anybody was interested, <laughs> so send me an email if you'd like to to have a word version. Um, it's a mile and a mile and a million from APL. I assure you. <laughs> And you won't see anything. I don't think you will see the slightest ghost of APL in the way I've been writing about things like whiskey and railways and um, the seashore of lighthouses and things of that sort. But that has become a, uh, an enthusiasm, not one which has developed from APL, I may say, but uh, one which is now my current way of life. <laughs> Fine. Thank you so much for coming then. And um, really appreciated it. And uh well we'll see if we if I can get additional people to come as I as I find them, as I get in touch with them. Um and uh we'll be Well thanks well, Adam for giving me the chance to uh, I was good to say to bore the pants off everybody. But... <laughs> not, <laughs> not at all. I was fascinated the whole way through, I can tell you that. So thank you so much. See you around everybody.